Now I want to give an idea or two in regard to the Christian's heaven. Of all the selfish things in this world, it is one man wanting to get to heaven, caring nothing what becomes of the rest of mankind. If I can only get my little soul in, I have always noticed that the people who have the smallest souls make the most fuss about getting them saved. Here is what we are taught by the church today. We are taught by it that fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, can all be happy in heaven, no matter who may be in hell. That the husband can be happy there, with the wife that would have died for him at any moment of his life in hell. But they say we don't believe in fire. What we believe in now is remorse. What will you have remorse for? For the mean things you have done when you are in hell? Will you have any remorse for the mean things you have done when you are in heaven? Or will you be so good then that you won't care how you used to be? Don't you see what an infinitely mean belief that is? I tell you today that no matter in what heaven you may be, no matter in what star you are spending the summer, if you meet another man whom you have wronged, you will drop a little behind in the tune. And no matter in what part of hell you are, and you meet someone whom you have succored, whose nakedness you have clothed, whose famine you have fed, the fire will cool up a little. According to this Christian doctrine, when you are in heaven, you won't care how mean you were once. What must be the social condition of a gentleman in heaven who will admit that he never would have been there if he had not got scared? What must be the social position of an angel who will always admit that if another had not pitied him, he ought to have been damned? Is it a compliment to an infinite God to say that every being he ever made deserved to be damned the minute he got him done, and that he will damn everybody he has not had a chance to make over? Is it possible that somebody else can be good for me, and that this doctrine of the atonement is the only anchor for the human soul? For instance, here is a man seventy years of age, who has been a splendid fellow and lived according to the laws of nature. He has got about him splendid children, whom he has loved and cared for with all his heart. He did not happen to believe in this Bible. He did not believe in the Pentateuch. He did not believe that because some children made fun of a gentleman who was short of hair, God sent two bears and tore the little darlings to pieces. He had a tender heart, and he thought about the mothers who would take the pieces, the bloody fragments of the children, and press them to their bosom in a frenzy of grief. He thought about their wails and lamentations, and could not believe that God was such an infinite monster. That was all he thought. But he went to hell. Then there is another man who made a hell on earth for his wife, who had to be taken to the insane asylum. And his children were driven from home, and his children were driven from home, and were wanderers and vagrants in the world. But just between the last sin and the last breath, this fellow got religion, and he never did another thing except to take his medicine. He never did a solitary human being a favor, and he died and went to heaven. Don't you think he would be astonished to see that other man in hell and say to himself, Is it possible that such a splendid character should bear such fruit, and that all my rascality at last has brought me next to God? Or let us put another case. You were once alone in the desert, no provisions, no water, no hope, and just when your life was at its lowest ebb, a man appeared, gave you water and food, and brought you safely out. How you would bless that man! Time rolls on, you die and go to heaven, and one day you see through the black night of hell the friend who saved your life, begging for a drop of water to cool his parched lips. He cries to you, Remember what I did in the desert. Give me to drink. How mean, how contemptible you would feel to see his suffering and be unable to relieve him. But this is the Christian heaven. 
we sit by the fireside and see the flames and the sparks fly up the chimney everybody happy and the cold wind and sleet are beating on the window and out on the doorstep is a mother with a child on her breast freezing how happy it makes a fireside that beautiful contrast and we say god is good and there we sit and she sits and moans not one night but forever or we are sitting at the table with our wives and children everybody eating happy and delighted and famine comes and pushes out its shriveled palms and with hungry eyes implores us for a crust how that would increase the appetite and yet that is the christian heaven don't you see that these infamous doctrines petrify the human heart and i would have everyone who hears me swear that he will never contribute another dollar to build another church in which is taught such infamous lies i want every one of you to say that you never will directly or indirectly give a dollar to any man to preach that falsehood it has done harm enough it has covered the world with blood it has filled the asylums for the insane it has cast a shadow in the heart in the sunlight of every good and tender man and woman i say let us rid the heavens of this monster and write upon the dome liberty love and law no matter what may come to me or what may come to you let us do exactly what we believe to be right and let us give the exact thought in our brains rather than have this christianity true i would rather all the gods would destroy themselves this morning i would rather the whole universe would go to nothing if such a thing were possible this instant rather than have the glittering dome of pleasure reared on the eternal abyss of pain i would see the utter and eternal destruction of this universe i would rather see the shining fabric of our universe crumble to unmeaning chaos and take itself where oblivion broods and memory forgets i would rather the blind samson of some imprisoned force released by thoughtless chance should so rack and strain this world that man in stress and strain in astonishment and fear should suddenly fall back to savagery and barbarity i would rather that this thrilled and thrilling globe shorn of all life should in its cycles rub the wheel the parent star on which the light should fall as fruitlessly as falls the gaze of love on death than to have this infamous doctrine of eternal punishment true rather than have this infamous selfishness of a heaven for a few and a hell for the many established as the word of god one world at a time is my doctrine let us make someone happy here happiness is the interest that a decent action draws and the more decent actions you do the larger your income will be let every man try to make his wife happy his children happy let every man try to make every day a joy and god cannot afford to damn such a man i cannot help god i cannot injure god i can help people i can injure people consequently humanity is the only real religion i cannot better close this lecture than by quoting four lines from robert burns to make a happy fireside climb to weans and wife that's the true pathos and sublime of human life end ingersoll's lecture on the mistakes of moses this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain ingersoll's lecture on the mistakes of moses is part of the book lectures of colonel robert green ingersoll read for you by ted delorme in fort mill south carolina during july 2007